once upon a tabletop, some adventurers gather to negotiate with goblins. Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Rutledge, and this is episode 12 of Colonial Caria Lark's Landing, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign being played at a local hobby shop called The Devil's Bench. The adventurers are back at their settlement, but only for two days. After that, they have to make the four-day journey that will bring them to the rendezvous for their meeting with a goblin tribe. However, the situation at home is grim. The Council have removed Kordak, the half-orc fighter, from his post as leader of the militia. They've said he's allowed to keep his position, but only so long as he stops going out on his scouting missions. They say that the leader of their defenses shouldn't be wandering off all the time. In spite of proof to the contrary, rumors abound that Stor, the goblin monk, is a murderer. But the worst part is that the settlement is facing a food shortage. After Balzar the Dragonborn Cleric and Acta the Tiefling Warlock slipped some rats into Nalor's shop, hoping for a little sabotage and mischief, the rats seem to have spread to the settlement's main food storage and have invited more friends to come along. Naldor and several others are working to remedy the situation, but a solution has yet to be found. Acta is awaiting a message from a mysterious friend of hers. She recalls that the last time she saw her, she was alone somewhere, so she heads out to the beach alone to wait, blowing into her conch shell all the while. While the rest of the group had been out on their last adventure, Gilgan, the human mystic, had been left at the settlement. To quickly catch up on events, Gilgan uses his powers to swap memories with Shent, the dwarven ranger. He then initiates a conversation with the group, wondering if they want to continue to support the settlement or if they want to strike off alone. They have a long debate on the matter. Gilgan is under the impression that the settlement is going downhill. Having shared Gilgan's memories, Shend realizes that this is an assumption based more on emotion than evidence. Kordak pops in and out of the discussion. He first heads off to find Gorbosh to confront him about the possibility that he may have murdered Kordak's family. He finds Gorbosh working on building a forge with stones from the mine. He asks some relatively subtle questions about Gorbash's past, when and where he stopped fighting for the Samvidian Empire. The time and place seem to match up. However, as Gorbash tells a tale, the ruins of the caravan that Kordak's family were in were already destroyed when he got there. Kordak accepts this and goes to tell Hargrom as much. Hargrom agrees to go easier on Gorbash and also reports that the ballista is complete. Before heading back home, Kordak goes to Gorbash one more time. He requests that once the materials are available, a great axe is made for him. Stor leaves the conversation early on to go and find Deltria. However, when he arrives at the mine, he finds her busy and looking exhausted. So instead, he heads back to town and goes to visit Ferion's tower. There, he asks a strange wizard if he has any books about goblins. He wants to be prepared for the upcoming meeting. Unfortunately, Ferion has no books or information to give him. He heads back home just in time to meet with the others coming out. The decision has been made that for now they want to keep helping the settlement. Gilgan heads off to continue helping Triana build her temple to the fore. Shen, Balazar, Kordak, and Stor head off into the jungle to gather food for the settlement. They have to travel for quite a distance before they get beyond the area that the usual forging parties have picked clean. They spend the rest of the day gathering as much food as they can and then make camp for the night. Down on the beach back at the settlement, night has fallen. Acta is giving up on waiting and is just about to head home when a door opens out of thin air. Out steps the humanoid fox creature known to Acta only as the Negotiator. Acta hands over the ogre's tooth, asking for confirmation that it is indeed the tooth of a giant kin. The negotiator says that it is, and that their mutual friend will be very happy with this. She then reminds Acta that she had said something about a favor. Acta asks if it would be possible for the negotiator to check up on her lost mother. The negotiator says she will do this, but only if Acta agrees to owe her a favor. Acta agrees without hesitation, and the negotiator grins, saying, Oh Acta, this is what I like so much about you. Then she disappears through another one of her magical doorways. Acta heads home for the night where she finds Gilligan already asleep. The next day, Gilligan returns to helping with the temple again. Not knowing what else to do with herself, Acta sets out to cause some mischief. She goes to Naldor's shop where she proceeds to move all kinds of things around. She piles a bunch of items on Naldor's counter and then offers a pile of dirt in trade for them. She's surprised to find Naldor not as irritated as she expected him to be. He's still in a foul mood, but this seems to be giving him a break from his greater problems. Her mischief managed, Acta heads out, deliberately leaving the door open on her way. The group out in the jungle gather more food, then bring home their haul. They arrive late in the afternoon. Stor proposes calling a council meeting. He wants to spread word of the Dragonborn Empire that they found evidence of. They agree and send out messengers. While they're waiting, Shen goes to visit Farian. He asks the wizard if he's able to enchant things. Farian says that he's been studying it and might be able to in the future. It takes a couple hours, but the council gets gathered. The council is fascinated by this information. Kordak also asks if it would be possible for him to be second in command of the militia, the position Hargrom used to have. 
The council accepts almost immediately. Most of them look relieved that Kordak is taking this as well as he apparently is. The group then gets an update on the state of the settlement from the rest of their members. Everything is going as well as can be expected in the circumstances. Naldor reports that he's working on trying to trap the rats. Shund and Sor volunteer to stay after the meeting to help him with his designs. He surprises them by accepting and even being a bit grateful for it. The adventurers head home for the night to sleep and prepare for their journey tomorrow. In the morning, the group head out. The first three days of their journey are uneventful. However, Acta does notice that Fluffy, her pseudo-dragon familiar who was sent ahead to scout the goblin camp, has not returned to them yet. When she expresses her concern, Gilgan sarcastically replies about oh how horrible it must be to have a familiar die. On the fourth day, they reach the field of blue grass and know that they're nearing the building where they fought Ugra the Ogress. As they're traveling through the long grass, they're pounced upon by four lionesses. They finish them off fairly quickly and skin them. Shend laments that they don't have time to hunt down the rest of the pride. They arrive at Ugra's house as the sun is setting. There they are met by an excited Fluffy. The pseudo-dragon tells Acta that he got lost and couldn't find his way home, so he waited here for them. Acta feels terrible about this and spends the night cuddling him. Gilligan comments that at least her familiar doesn't give her sass. Kordak points out that she didn't yell at her familiar for doing what she asked it to. Gilgan's familiar Pablo, the cat-eyed parrot, agrees with Kordak. Gilgan gets mad and puts Pablo away in a pocket dimension. Then he goes to examine and repair the magical fresco wall. However, he doesn't seem to glean any important information from it. They set their watches and go to sleep for the night, with Shenden Store choosing to sleep on the roof. On their way up, they discover the eastern wall covered with grapevines. Sor grabs a bunch and starts eating them, nearly breaking a tooth as he almost bites into a seed. After that, he eats them more carefully. The night passes uneventfully. The dawn rises on the 21st of Waning Spring, the night of the full moon and when they're meant to meet the goblins. However, they don't know exactly when the goblins will arrive. So all of them, except Gilligan, begin cleaning out the building, thinking perhaps that they might be able to use it as a base. While doing so, they magically repair the front doors. Gilgan climbs up to the roof alone and pulls Pablo out of his pocket dimension. He wants to settle this situation once and for all. He then has a long telepathic argument with Pablo where his familiar insists that he did what he was told and Gilgan insists that he didn't. In the end, Gilgan asks if it's going to come up again and Pablo insists that he wasn't the one who brought it up. He also points out that Gilgan missed something while examining the fresco. He can't communicate exactly what it is, so Gilgan puts him in his pocket dimension again and goes to examine it himself. He manages to find a thin crack running down the entire center of the fresco, cunningly hidden in the carving. However, before he can think much on it, the goblin delegation arrives. The delegation that consists of one goblin. They recognize him as Ilk, one of the two goblins they had met here before. They ask where Darg, the other goblin, is. The nervous replies that Grubfrub doesn't like his scouts to be seen, but Darg was alive last time Ilk saw him. Ilk is to lead the adventurers to meet Grubfrub. They agree and follow him. The journey takes most of the rest of the day. It brings them further east and along the edge of a low mountain range. They question Ilk along the road and discover that Grubfrub, the goblin leader, isn't a goblin. He's a bugbear, which is a larger, more ferocious type of goblinoid. They also hear about a few other creatures that are in the region, such as a blue dragon and some centaurs. Gilligan tries to get more information, but manages to get Ilk thinking he's crazy. As the party are led into the camp, they can't get a headcount on exactly how many goblins there are, but they know it's in the hundreds. They're led through a haphazard encampment made up of very crude tents. At least for the goblins that even have tents. Shend is particularly impressed with one goblin that has made a tent out of a gazelle split down the center, using its legs for its supports. A perfect tent for the nighttime snacking type. They also notice the corpse of a brontosaurus which seems to be being used as a food source. However, the tent they are led to is impossible to miss. It's crudely sewn out of furs and is over 100 feet long and another 50 wide. A smaller tent is outside of it from which goblins are occasionally scurrying in and out. The adventurers have a quick discussion, appointing Kordak as their leader, since the goblins didn't seem to understand the concept that they are all equals. They head into the tent, which has its sides lined with goblins. In the center is a very large fire, above which is suspended a goblin tied in ropes. They recognize Darg. There's a rope leading from Darg through a pulley system to the far end of the tent. There, sitting in a chair surrounded by guards, is Grubfrub, the bugbear. Shend boastfully announces Kordak's presence, and they approach the goblinoid leader. As they do so, they notice that Darg is occasionally lowered closer to the fire. This is accompanied by his screams and laughter from all the other goblins. Kordak begins speaking with Grubfrub, trying to negotiate an alliance. It's a little difficult because he has to convey the idea of what trading is. The goblins seem to believe that if they want something that someone else has, they just take it. 
This exchanging of goods is a very novel concept. It's also made more difficult by the fact that they don't want to reveal the exact location of their settlement. They do mention that they believe three scouts from this camp had been there. Grubfrub admits to having lost three scouts recently. He doesn't seem to care much about their deaths and expresses that he doesn't like his scouts being seen. He points out Darg as an example while lowering him closer to the fire. Eventually Kordak admits that they live on the coast. Grubfrub has a hard time believing this because of something called the Soggy Alliance. Apparently there are creatures that have claimed all the land within two days of the ocean. These creatures are so devastating that Grubfrub hasn't heard of anyone living there for generations. However, he eventually agrees to alliance in exchange for help in attacking a hobgoblin city. He says it's something called the time of the hobnob and that the hobgoblins will be weaker. Kordak agrees. They seal the deal with a drink brought in by an abused goblin girl. It's a very potent fruit-based alcohol that tastes disgusting. Gilgit refuses to drink his, waiting to see if something bad happens to everyone else. Grubfrub gives him the stink eye, so Kordak grabs the goblet and downs it. Acta throws up. The others, except for Kordak, instantly start feeling a bit lightheaded. Grubfrub says that they can stay in the camp for the night, however they have to find their own tents. With pity in their eyes, they glance back at Dark as they head out to find where they'll sleep for the night. And that's where this week's session comes to a close. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and leave a comment down below letting me know what you think. If you want to support this channel, there's a link for that down in the doobly-doo, as well as a link to my website where you can buy the chainmail that I make. And that's all for today. Come back in a week to find out what happens next, once upon a tabletop.